I'll introduce you up here, Julia. Yes, where would you like me? An easy way to introduce you is you're the author of this astonishing new book, The Nowhere Office, but you're f and the host of a podcast of the same name. Um, but you're much more than that. And, and so I'd love you to <laughs> introduce yourself as you might introduce yourself. Oh, well, hello, everybody. I love this weird third space. It's very appropriate for an author of The Nowhere Office to be in a nowhere space where you're all wearing headphones. Very high tech. Um, I write and think about connected society. I wrote a book called Fully Connected in 2017. Then I wrote a follow-up that was a bit more practical called The Simplicity Principle and now I've written a Nowhere Office, Reinventing Work and the Work uh, Place of the Future and I'm an entrepreneur that has put on events. But for the purpose of this conversation, that is what is on my mind, is how do we work, where do we work, when do we work and why? For me, your CV is so intriguing because I couldn't quite work out. If I was going to split the world into insiders and outsiders, <laughs> I couldn't decide if you, because you work with think tanks, you work with yes. authorities, you're, you're on call with governments, you know, all of the classic insider stuff. But you've got this sort of subversive, yes. roguish, mischief, mischievous aspect to you. Do you see yourself as an insider or an outsider? Oh, I see myself... As an outsider, it's interesting, there's a wonderful quote in Margaret Atwood's novel, The Handmaid's Tale, um, about, I think it goes something like this, we were the people on the blank white spaces on the edge of the print, it gave us more freedom. And so even though I like to know what's going on, and I definitely, one needs networks and contacts if you're writing and thinking, so you can get insight and intelligence, I don't like to go with the herd and and in a way the thesis of the nowhere office and what i'm arguing is quite subversive uh so even though i do do corporate consulting now obviously inevitably and i've always been a consultant you know when organizations come to me and they say how can you how can you help us get people back to the office i say wrong question if you want me to help you answer what's going on, what do we do, I'm in. So from that point of view, I think I'm a little bit atypical. Right. I mean, certainly a consultant who turns down work is not normal, is what it? What was your relationship with the office? So you've, you've written this book, which is talking about how we might evolve to something beyond the office. But what was your relationship with the office before? It's a really good question. I mean, in some ways, I suppose my relationship to the office is just that it's a relationship and you know the book has as I think well you know the book is framed very much in terms of what age are we in of the office and I'm saying we're in the fourth age like the fourth industrial uh, revolution we're in the fourth age since the end of the second world war a period in which there was enormous faith and optimism and necessity in the fixed office and the fixed routine and now where we're not and my career which is pretty long not as not doesn't go back to the second world war but i was born in 1964 i've worked in about 10 to 12 big offices in my career including somerset house which was sort of great offices of state actually um and the bottom line of it is I feel great fondness and great affection for those places. But I feel that that phase has come to an end in the sense of a fixed place that you go to all the time. So I'm, my nowhere office argument is not no office, it's not anti-office, but it's saying that the way anyone in the knowledge field works is about the person, not the place. And of course, I would say this at COGX, that's sort of because of the tech. So we're in this glorious part of, um, we're in this glorious part of King's Cross that is being, we're in this glorious part of King's Cross that is being strongly developed at the moment. It's transforming before our very eyes. And there's a monumental office by Google across the way. And these, it's suggested that the space we're in is going to be a new headquarters of one of the other big tech giants. So there's a lot of people doubling down on the office, spending a lot of money on the office. Um, the question is, 
do they have it wrong? How do you believe that they're going to work? So we've seen yeah. big firms like Google and Apple certainly frustrate their employees by mandating set number of days. Apple is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday in the office. Google has said you need to be in the office three days and broadly people are falling into Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Do they have it wrong? I think they actually do have it wrong. Is that better? Can anyone? Yeah, okay, sorry. I love it when tech doesn't work, especially at tech conferences. Could I just put that on the record? The, the handheld, the, 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 the timeometer is frozen. But anyway, um, sorry to be mean. Um, I think that everyone's got it wrong because I think what's happened is that an old model that was seen as very fixed has been tested so completely in the world, i.e. everyone who works in an office, which is about a sixth of the world. It's not obviously everybody and there are degrees and some people who work in an office, and I don't just mean cleaners and reception. Some people who work from an office don't have any variability about what they can do. But largely speaking, most people who work from an office now can separate out the tasks they do with digital and technology versus why come in. And so absolutely everything has changed. But the corporate world, which has been built for a very long time on a globalized, standardized set of norms from, you know, Singapore to Streatham to Seattle, from hiring and recruiting and managing and software. The reality that there actually is no one size fits all anymore, that what a three, two model for one workplace might be great in London in the month of June is just not applicable to somebody else's workplace. And that must be really freaky for people trying to make predictable patterns. And so, the irony is that, that's why I've called it nowhere, that everybody who's trying to standardise has sort of got it wrong because there's no right answer. So if we've been really specific, so you, what you're specifically saying, the era of the office is gone for knowledge workers. I'm saying the era of the office as it was modelled before is gone. I think of it like the way babies grow up into toddlers, grow up into young children, grow up into teenagers, grow up into adults, and at some point they leave home. Now they're the same people, their relationship is with the same family, but their physical, spatial, emotional, intellectual relationship to that family and that home changes, and that's the model. And so people who are holding on to a hybrid model of 3-2 or a, a, a structured hybrid model, where would you place them in, in your I think they are slightly like the parent looking at their 21-year-old right. going, oh, Bubsy, would you? what would you like for dinner? And the 21-year-old's going, don't baby me, don't belittle me. I mean, the point I'm making is I've been to, I won't name them, I've been to some of these organisations. We are talking morgue offices. We are talking about massive asymmetry. We're talking about quite a challenge to redesign a space in a meaningful way. Uh, let me put it like this, and by the way, I could be completely wrong because the nowhere office is a sort of liminal here and now moment, but so far I don't feel I'm wildly wrong. I would say the office, the place, the base, the masthead location that you go to or your people go to should be for three things only, with the exception of you might be, you know, really very much an introvert who just wants to, you know, work at a desk somewhere, or you might be someone for whom the better coffee and the showers in the office are a good thanks. But generally speaking, everybody else, First of all, if you need to resolve a conflict, you have to do that in person. It's not an advisable thing to do it on Zoom, as we know from Jackie Weaver. That's the first thing. The second thing is to learn and to network. You know, apropos why don't I think the 3-2 is, and I don't really like the four-day week, I think it's all a bit like the 5-2 diet, which is 
you know, it's a construct. In the end, you could argue that newbies, what I call the learners, the 18 to 23 year olds, you could argue that they really are like babies. Babies need to cook in the belly of their mums for nine months. It's a massive problem if they come out early because they're just not ready. You could argue that every single organisation of scale says to their newbies, we're not even going to talk about 325242, anything. You're coming in for nine months because we need and we're going to tell our other people to come in. And do you see what I mean? That would be a completely but different model. who would be model. there for them? We're going to tell our older people, you know, Tuesdays, Wednesday, you know, if you're on the board, if you're an executive, you have to come in for them. Right. But our other teams might work in an immersive way right. or they might work three, two. In other words, isn't there always going to be someone in their first nine months of a career? I'm just trying to work no, out the mechanics. You see, the recruitment it. at the moment is all over the place. The, re right. the recruitment is showing in the knowledge sectors that if you do not offer hybrid or fully remote, that's a problem. And so if there's pushback, why is there pushback? So at the moment, I think leaders are trying to standardise in a way that's not reactive and they're getting non-compliance. There's about 40% non-compliance at the moment across the world of the corporates, of, according to Nicholas Bloom of Stanford, who's done a lot of this research, that people are told you come in on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and then every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there's a group going, oh, I don't think so. So, so are your three things conflict, learning and networking? as reasons to be in right yes right. yes i mean what do you think um yeah it, it raises sort of an interesting point because i, I think it, it, as time was going on we're starting to see the office as a tool that we're using and so you do see some firms strongly articulating that the likes of dropbox or salesforce saying that in the old ways that you'd see the office as a you'd go off-site to have an off-site now treat the office as the place to have your on-site um yeah. I, you know, I, I think for me, the office has probably got six functions to it, it's, uh, where the office is a place, um, team cohesion, I think, is a really critical part. Learning is a really critical part. Increasingly, um, the office will be an embodiment of our CSR goals. Um, you know, like if you're saying that you've got renewable focus or you're... you're you've got an ecological footprint your office will be a manifestation of that you know yeah. you try and demonstrate that but you know then obviously this meeting people by appointment meeting people at, by accident i think broadly okay so serendipity we must talk about right. serendipity because the water cooler is a big reason why people have been terribly worried about anybody not going back to the office just this point though about the immersion and the conference and the inboarding i was actually talking to um an international uh, office in Europe of Dropbox yesterday. Um, Dropbox have renamed their offices studios, mm. but as you know, they've gone for a remote first strategy. Now, I don't think a remote first strategy is feasible for anybody that isn't a tech company, right. which is why I'm not anti office. I just want to be. Why would that be? Why, why is it not feasible for other people? Well, I think that if you look at the pushback we're getting at the moment from managers and leaders of a certain generation i just want to get us to a point where there's a bit of change happening manageably i think that you know presenteeism in order to have you visible to your manager and leader when there actually may not be a point to it is really quite a widespread thing still that's where you get elon musk i mean you know what a disappointment that such a genius seems to have really it started to make a series of very peculiar pronouncements about, I'm not even talking about Twitter, I'm just talking about work, you know, sending his executives a message saying, you know, stop phoning it in and you'll be fired. That's not the way to do it. It's not that I don't think there are certain jobs, workplace by workplace, that you need to have an agreement and an understanding that success might look like. I mean, Bruce, we're sitting here, if you'd said, an hour before, I'll phone it in. I'd be annoyed, right? I'm not saying don't turn It's interesting because when you and I were chatting before, you said something that was really interesting for me and I just wanted to ask you about it. You said that you don't believe face-to-face -face is of qualitative 
in, uh, superiority to being remote? Well, I d look, I, I mean, I've made a career advocating face to face. In fact, I used to have a sort of strap line of face to face in a Facebook world. Trust and intimacy and all those nonverbal cues and all the things that we know AI struggles to emulate are most definitely inferior, inferior if they're just digitally, digitally delivered. And we know a lot of data that Microsoft has done and others that show that teleconferencing is not yet where it needs to be. But, 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 there are now more data sets since the pandemic. We definitely know that minority groups feel more equal in a box of the same size. They feel that the trade-off of being uh, on a screen, you might miss out on the juice and the serendipity around the table and the gossip, but you gain by not having microaggressions leaving aside the cost of the commute. So that is, that is a really real thing and that surprises me. And the other thing is, is that when everybody is really forced, which we were globally, to use technology, not in an asymmetric, you know, B-list way, which is what Zoom and Teams were looked at before the pandemic, but in a, this is the lifeline way, something very peculiar happens, which is that humans recreate that trust and intimacy with that technology, which is why psychotherapy is booming on teleconferencing. Thank you very much. And it's also why um, you, you, you know, you see things like the WhatsApp groups. I organized a wake for a close friend who died last year. Um, and about 50 of us joined we, it was like low-tech, high-tech. I set up a WhatsApp group. I sent out a message saying I will be lighting a candle in my living room playing this playlist of songs that remind me of our friend Jessica. Does anyone want to join me? And we were all there. And it was the most incredible, powerful, moving thing. And it was more moving for me than the memorial service in real life in a museum four months later. So something odd is happening right. and changing. So, so those norms, those maybe th th the instinct that certain things are superior has maybe been reevaluated. And I, yes, and I think one other thing I would just say on that is that my research shows that collaborative software has really come on. A, a, you know, pre-pandemic, you had the Slack channels, you had the group chats, uh, at least one head of legal at a very, very major global company said that they spent more time dealing with the fallout for what people said on the chat on, on their internal channels than anything else. People libeling each other and goodness knows what. I think I heard a snigger there, even though you're all on headphones and supposed to be quiet. But, you know, a little bit of, no yes, look, you're smiling, you're nodding. Do you know what I mean? You know, people bitching about each other like they're on a Facebook group. Someone else is nodding. So the truth is that I think before the pandemic, this collaborative software was actually about people at their desk, present, going off to the water cooler, having quite a lot of toxicity, coming back sharing documents and things that they could in fact do from home. Now, you've got really interesting platforms emerging, like this company Groove that's running out of Israel that came out of WeWork, that is a sort of, you can be in your workspace, your home, your office, and you can jump on a Groove, be with other people and say, this is my goal, or this is what I'm struggling with, and then sort of leave them there with a live channel but get on and do your work. So I'm really fascinated by the different ways in which we're collaborating and using tech. And again, not necessarily having to be in a sort of brainstorm situation, yeah. which I think does need. Yeah. And I guess, you know, you mentioned Professor Nick Bloom before, and one of the things that he tracks, he's incredibly generous with all of his data, but one of the things he tracks is the, the number of patents, the number yes. of applications yes. of, of new technology. And, mm. and as far as I can see from his data, it's gone through the roof exponentially. So maybe those are the second order effects that we've not even begin to see yet. But you wrote this remarkably prescient book and a book that's 
achieved massive take up. So you must Thank have you. you must have put these words to bed six months ago. There must have been a, a, a degree of you thinking. I'm sort of guessing a bit. Since you've published it, what has surprised you that maybe hasn't landed or has gone further than what you anticipated? Well. I wasn't guessing, I felt absolutely certain, and maybe that's the certainty of a fool. I absolutely was not guessing. I was very anxious that events were just superseding. You know, you have this canal lock gate, open, shut, working, not working, pandemic -y thing happening, that was difficult. Um, and, and, you know, so it was evolving. So I felt like I was actually doing reportage by the end as well. Um, in the hundred or so days since the book's come out here and in America, there has been a lot of take up. I suppose I'm seeing some some trends that are moving beyond the when and where you work thing. And really they're to do with power, the recognition, whether it's the pop-up unions, whether it's the recognition that the talent in the labour market has got more power, whether it's non-compliance. I think that's one issue. The second is that the commute is dead. The office may not be dead, but the commute is. Nobody wants the commute. Everybody hates the commute. I've just done a programme in my podcast, The Nowhere Office from Atlanta. You know, very big tech hub, the sixth largest economy in America, you know, uh, surrounded by uh, freeways. You know, the late motif of the city and the working centre for the last 70 years. Well, there are lots of workarounds there. Um, so the trends I'm seeing are that there's a dawning realization that one size doesn't fit all and that's really frightening leaders. And so they are, well, certainly they're pleasingly ringing my bell going, can you help us think about it? You know, surprising groups of What do you say people. to them? Someone phones you up, they say, we're wrestling with these themes. We don't know what to do. Maybe our instinct of our Gen X bosses or millennial, late millennial bosses is to get people back. What do you say to them? Well, I mean, like any consultant, you say, you know, come in and let me take a bit of a, I'll come in and let, let's talk about it and let's take a read and let's scope it out. I would say fundamentally what the leader is learning is that they have to listen, that this top down bought in, this is how we do it. This is how everybody does it. This is what Biddly Boo over there is doing. I mean, look at the pickle Goldman Sachs got themselves in and Apple, you know, never have sexy, big, muscular finance tech companies looked foolish and on the back foot. Google had the same problem. So something is shifting. Um, but the other thing I think is that I'm definitely sensing and I've written about is an awareness that purpose-driven workplaces with a generation of people that they want work to matter, they want their life to be factored in. The smartphone brings your life into your work anyway. The indivisibility that you're, you know, on social media that's personal, that's business, that you're downloading a document, that you're joining a teleconference, that you're sending your loved one what you want for dinner or a picture. It's all blurred. That's in the room. That's not going to go back. Um, and I suppose the final thing is that well-being which was quite beanbaggy and quite sort of well-meaning, wasn't really about what I think we're now entertaining the idea of, which is, does work work well for both sides of the equation? And if not, why not? So you've got all these dreadfully complicated headwinds, inflation, the markets, all of that can't do anything about that individual workplace by workplace. But you can say, we want our workplace to be working well, and we want it to be a place of strength. And so we need to rethink and reframe what that looks like. And just telling people that we know you're mentally fragile and that you're going to have mental health day, that's not enough either. You need to make the work work. And the final point I'd say is that pre-pandemic, the World Health Organization and every single metric showed that in the round, work wasn't working. It was toxic, it was full of stress, it was burnout. And so I think this moment, this nowhere moment is a moment that, if I can be vulgar, it was a bit like me too, it was in plain sight and then it just tipped 
and now we all know it needs to be different and it's never going to go back. Okay, so we're going to take questions from the floor. And by God, I've got no way of knowing how we're going to take those questions. So I'm just giving <laughs> you a the prompt tech, there. Um, I'm just, I, we're going to do hands up. Is that what we're doing? Okay. I just want to ask you one more thing before we go to those. So uh, by, uh, aside from that um, individual there, if you could, if you could uh, ready your questions. Um, yeah, I, I was just... Uh, I've lost my place there. Uh, so, so, like... Um, Oh yeah, the, the question I was going to ask is that we've sort of anticipated this. Uh, when we entered the pandemic, we anticipated it was going to be an economic collapse. And actually most organisations have come through, it, with the exception of one or two sectors, saying broadly we've had a couple of good years of business. The lights have stayed on. Now we find ourselves looking towards a recession or, or you know, growth has, has stalled. Have we made a mistake of thinking that it was a seller's market and the jobs market, for example? You know, people could quit a job to try and uh, to try and get what they wanted because there were plenty of jobs. In two years' time, might be we we'd be looking at this thinking actually there's been a degree of regression because economic fortunes have been a lot harder for. for it could job be. Tenders. I don't think so, uh, but it could be. It could be, for instance, that some organisations are so wedded to presenteeism and control, because let's it is about control and surveillance as well, and old management rather than more iterative management, you could say that they'll go, look, we'll pay your home heating bills and we'll pay your commute and we'll keep you the same pay and you can have Fridays off. Do you know what I mean? It's possible. It depends how much skin in the game right. those companies have. But if that is the case, then the data to look at will be the churn. And the only thing that I'd say is that the market in the service sector economy, which is growing at like 40% in the developing world, in America, 50% of the knowledge worker workforce will be freelance by 2030. So the old sort of people presenteeism that you had a job and that's you worked a, your way huge, up the profession. That's a huge change. So what, by 2030, so in eight years time, 30% of the knowledge workers will be freelance. Well, if you think about it, everyone here has probably got or knows someone or is considering or has had a side hustle. Right. So even if you're employed or you're contracted or you're subcontracted, your, go, your physical spatial relationship right. to a place and an organisation is likely to be fragmented and shared and so it's these trends that I think we've got to look at and we haven't even touched on the city to the suburb but I'd love to hear yeah well, let's, what people let's think. delve in so uh, that patient soul was um, I think there's a microphone coming to you just there Thank you. Um, I really love the phrase, we need to make work work. Um, and I wondered if you had some, um, in terms of like where, where we are right now, and I understand that organizations are grappling with that um, concept, some early examples of people who are making work work. How do we make work work, Julia? Well, I think the purpose linked to productivity, there's a whole chapter in the book on purpose and productivity. You know, people have said for years, sort of slightly patronizingly, oh, productivity, it's terribly difficult to measure in the knowledge economy, you know, da, 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 it's really, got, and it's like, actually it isn't, really. If you're engaged, if people feel they're doing good stuff, then they're, and they're well remunerated, then they're go, the work is gonna work. And I think the glass door rankings, there's lots of current metrics of work being good. Work works when everybody is aligned and when the difficulties are faced honestly, whether they're difficulties that arise because of new circumstances or because of new issues in the marketplace. Work doesn't work when there's bad management, bad leadership, overinvestment in a narrative that's out of date and toxic politics. So sorry to be general, but work when you know it, you know it. Okay. Any more? There was someone over here a minute ago. Yes, go on there. This lady there. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, I just want to go back to your question about uh, younger um, people starting, uh, you know, stepping into workplace and, and them uh, maybe requiring to be around for longer and being in the office. 
but at the same time, uh, you also just recognize that everyone has a side hustle and actually young people have much more complicated lives uh, than maybe people who were starting their careers 10 or 20 years ago. So what are the trends that we are seeing in, in that kind of side hustle environment that is kind of now becoming not so much side? Well, the, Thank you. the the legal frameworks are changing, you know, here the right to request flexible working um, which kicked in after a certain period of time is going to kick in earlier. In Germany a new labour law is going to be developed. There are all sorts of legal complexities that are going to impact on, again, whether people can compel you to work and, you know, what levers can, can be pulled. Um, what I think isn't going away is the data that really just shows again and again and again it really doesn't matter whose data you look at it's McKinsey's data it's Nick's data it's the 50,000 55,000 44 country PwC data the other day that showed that 26 percent of people are considering leaving their jobs in a year for one of three reasons and each of those reasons is to do with bad management horrible bosses toxic workplace and so on and so forth and that what everybody wants is what you might call have your cake and eat it. They want mobility, freedom, choice, agency. They want agency, I would say, more than they don't want the commute, but they don't want the commute and they want agency, and don't we all? But they also want the home, like the teenager and the young adult that's left home. They want the base. They want, And so from, from an economic point of view, that is an absolute nightmare for people managing the property portfolio because on the one hand they've got to sort of get rid of the space they're not going to use or refurbish it or repurpose it and actually have everybody running around going I'm making my own patterns so we're going to have to have some guardrails I just don't know whether the guardrails are Tuesday Wednesday Thursday someone said to me oh Julia you're a potato I said thanks very much they, and I'm, a, I'm possibly in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But, you know, I change my model of when I'm available for meetings. I change it because I'm not sure either what works for me. Because I've got physical work, reading, thinking, being in physical presence with people. I've also got emails, documents, collaborative things I do with my production team in different countries, in different time zones with guests. And then there's travel time. You know, so it, it, the space is not about the physical space. It's actually about the other space, the cyberspace. So if you were going to project forward, you've, you've sort of said, I guess what you're saying is if you were setting up a company today, you wouldn't be getting as much real estate as... Absolutely as, not. And, and anyone that says you would, well, okay, you're going to have to have the kind of de deep pockets. What are the second order effects of that? You know, the, okay, these the areas here, I presume, will end up with some nice anchor tenants in them. But what are the second order effects? Well, I'm really interested in the idea that there is going to be a collapse. I'm sort of calling, maybe completely wrong, that there's a sort the, the you know, we work is probably going to ultimately be the dominant model, the co-working space. So the hotel will offer itself as a co-working space. The office will become a co-working space. The co-working space will become a co-working space. Where are the hotel rooms? That's what interests me. So, for example, I went to my publishers on the Avenue of the Americas in New York. Vast, vast space. Now, admittedly, I went back before the return to office rule. Pretty sparsely populated, pretty difficult to imagine, and I know people have moved out. I was in Paris the other day. People move out to a commuter belt difference. So imagine a scenario where you say, okay, Bruce, you are headquartered in London, but you now live in Birmingham. We want you in every three weeks for five days. Are we going to put you up in a hotel or are we going to give a floor of the building to suites? What is it, so they're going to accommodate me? I don't know. I don't want to go all Dave Eggers and I'm say you've all got to be present like the circle and monitored. But I mean, the space is going to be adjusted 
in line the technology and the space that goes in it. I mean, one final point is when I was writing this book, I thought I'll just look up the projected rise in the market of office chairs and I'll compare it to the projected rise in market of headsets. Now, all right, the headsets is also the gaming, so it's a bit of an unfair advantage, but suffice to say, you're not investing in office chairs. The money is not in office chairs. The money is in the headsets because the money is in mobility and cyberspace. How people connect with their humanness, where they do it, that's for human ingenuity. And you do not have to go through a turnstile up 17 floors to get to a water cooler. We're in a water cooler. A WhatsApp is a water cooler. So what are you asking people to do? And I think office workers are like members of a family. They don't like the bullshit. Tell them what there's ne what's needed and why. Give them confidence. They'll be led. But if they don't see the sense in it, they won't comply. This gentleman here has a question. I'm, not, I'm still not forgiving you for sending me back to Birmingham in that story. Well, Bir all right. Birmingham could be the HQ. <laughs> You're sending me back because you want me to go back there. I right, think, well, Birmingham's gentleman. on the up. Sorry, <laughs> it was a compliment. I, I came from Birmingham, so don't worry about it. Um, Julia, it's really interesting. Here's a question for you. And full disclosure, I was sitting on the board of a company that provides soundscapes and we've been doing heaps of business with tech firms trying to attract their their staff back to their offices by making the offices more fun and funky and interesting but during the sales process quite often we ask the leadership of those companies you know wh why do you want to bring people back and i find there's a real paucity of reasons yeah that there doesn't appear to be a reason except for the fact that that was how it was yeah. and we've got thousands of acres of real estate that we need to populate. Exactly, which isn't a good, a good enough reason. So, well, that, that was the, the question was, in your exposure to these companies, do they give you any reasons that are worth it? I think you've already they answered. They are beginning <laughs> to realise, and, and, you know, the diet lifestyle thing, I've written a lot about sort of the comparisons between physical health, mental health, and what I call social health, connected behaviour, using digital, using people. You know, we've all got a new literacy around diet and exercise. We all used to go on a treadmill for 59 hours. Well, we know we don't need to do that anymore. We do high intensity. We all used to starve ourselves on calorie controlled diets. Well, we don't do that anymore because we know that it's more complicated than that, that every, you know, your body's requirement for what it eats and doesn't eat is totally different to yours. We've, we need a new era of, of sophistication. And I suppose I'd just finish by saying, imagine a snow globe of the world of work. That's how I open the book. You know, the snow globe, you must have all got one or you've got an auntie that's got one. They're about 100 years old, so they're about as old as the office. Uh, they used to be filled with glycerin and glass and been a bit dumbed down now to sort of water and plastic. But it was always, wasn't it, a depiction of a place, a meaningful place at the base that was the anchor and then you had the fluttering flash of change with the snow so that you could, you know, because we're all restless beings. But if you really look at the world of work now, it's not a place anyway, whether that place is under a tree or an office or a notepad or a mobile. The shift is from the place to the person. It's you. It's your identity, your life your work life and how you're remunerated for the work you do. And if leaders get that and start to rethink, I think it could just be the most fantastic moment. I think the Nowhere Office is a really, really positive moment. I think we're out of time, but Julia, I just want to... Come and find me afterwards if you want to. I just want to thank you for such a, a dazzling contribution to the discussion and thank debate. Thank you. And uh, thank you once again for the event. Thank, thank you. you.